and welcome to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Joe Weisenthal. And I'm Tracy Alloway. Tracy, do you know my favorite thing about working in Midtown Manhattan? <laughs> Is it the daily commute? <laughs> Actually, I have a fine commute. I'm like a few stops away on the subway. That's fine. Yeah, I guess so. No, I love the plethora of bowl lunch <laughs> options that we have around us. We are in the bowl lunch capital of the world. <laughs> Maybe DC also, but I imagine like the per capita number of places that let you like get something that's sort of like, like you're feeding from a trough and you can get it right in front of your computer and eat while checking Twitter or your emails. It's very nice. I feel very old because I remember like when none of these existed and if you wanted to get lunch in Midtown Manhattan, you went to like a sandwich shop and you had a selection of sandwiches and you weren't allowed to make any individual customer choices. And I guess the upside of that was it took everyone literally 10 seconds to order and now it seems to take everyone about six minutes oh, yeah. but of course the downside is you weren't able to customize you weren't able to get the specific things that you want maybe pay as much attention as you can now to ingredients so it's definitely changed it's definitely changed by the way speaking of change i've been re-watching uh i think it's on hulu or something the old uh, la law episodes that are <laughs> streaming again and it's so funny watching what professional lunches looked like in the 80s with, like white <laughs> tablecloths was it steak it was it was like fancy fancier like plates of I don't know vegetables over a piece of fish and people like, actually going out to going restaurants out. anyway so yeah. that's a side diversion but I actually do like being able to just eat in a bowl uh, at my computer and staring <laughs> at the screen anyway but it, it does raise the question there are all these chains and one-offs doing salads and Mediterranean bowls and kava and knockoff kava and knockoff of the knockoff kava and salad bowls and stuff like that and knockoff chipotles. How do you stand out? How do you win in this game where there are clearly many competitors? No, I completely agree. It seems like a crowded market at the moment and everyone, even the non-bowl places have their version of a bowl nowadays. But also I'm really interested in how you come up with the specific offerings yeah. for customers and like how much of it is what people are asking for, so demand, versus supply. Like, what is available to you in terms of ingredients at a cost-effective price? Totally. Well, we really do have the perfect guest to talk about all of this, how the lunches that we eat get in front of us, how the ingredients are selected. Why am I eating this salad that I'm eating right now? <laughs> Figuratively, I'm not eating a salad right now. We are going to be speaking with Nick Jamey. He is the co-founder of Sweet Green, one of the success stories in the salad bowl game. So, Nick, thank you so much for uh, coming on Odd Lots. Thanks for having me. We, well, there's plenty of things to talk about in the bowl game, but let's start with something. You recently announced that Sweet Green is going to be uh, not cooking anything in seed oils and is only going to be using, I think, olive oil and other higher quality oils. There is an internet community of people who are like really anti-seed oils. Can I just say, this is Joe's bros. dream, is to finally do <laughs> the anti-seed oil episode. <laughs> We're going to do an hour-long conversation about seed oils and seed oil bros. What, but actually, for real though, I am curious. Why did you make this switch? How much is it actual customer demand? How much is it science? How much is it quality? Where did this come from and how much is it going to cost you? Uh, great question. So I'm glad we have an hour because there's lots to talk about here. We can go deep. But zooming out and backing up a bit, the reason we started Sweet Greens was because yeah. we did see this shift in the consumer and this between their relationship with food. And we saw this conversation starting to change. We were seniors at Georgetown, myself and my co-founders, Jonathan and Nate. And we were missing the options that we, we wish we had to eat. And this idea of wanting food that was good for you, that made you feel good, but that was also delicious and craveable and cool, um, we didn't see any of those options. And when we, we looked around, all the food that was the most delicious, the most craveable, the most accessible, the coolest brands were all the least healthy. Right. And so we wanted to change that. We wrote a business plan and really in an effort to redefine and rethink fast food, the traditional fast food model of what you were sourcing, what you were serving, how you were prepping it, and ultimately the story you were telling around that food. And over the course of the last 16 years, we really tried to create an incredible level of transparency around our food, how we're sourcing it, and why all that is important, and, and ultimately how all that leads to really delicious, craveable food. And the consumer has changed a lot in 16 years, and I'm happy to talk about different parts of that, but so much of it has been around removing friction between them and, and their meal and their food, whether that's you know the convenience of how you order it or how you pick it up or how it comes to you, or just the 
convenience or friction of understanding what is in your food and what right. you're eating and how it makes you feel. And so I think what got us excited to grow Sweet Green was this kind of lifting of the curtain between consumers and their food. And I remember very specifically, you know, the kind of questions consumers asked when we first started Sweet Green about their food and what they ask today are so different. Uh, the information they want to know about their food. And so we've been on this, you know, so far 16 year journey, which sounds like a long time, but we still think we're very in the very early innings of our of our journey. But in 16 years, it's it's wild to see just the shift of the consumer, what they want to know, their connection to food, and you know how, how we are part of that. So wait, so seed oils though? Yes. <laughs> were they asking <laughs> questions? So yeah, about this is the, this is what I want yes. to know. Were they? What was going on here? Was it actual demand? Was it just tweets? Was it uh, what what happened there? So, you know, we spend a lot of time looking at all of our ingredients, our whole supply chain. We also spend a lot of time understanding our consumer, um, what they're talking about, what they care, what they value. Um, and it's kind of this balance of learning from the customer, but also leading them in places we think are important for the food system and for mm -hmm. our fast food model. And our menu and our sources has, have evolved so much in 16 years. So we had seen this growing conversation around seed oils. And, you know, the more we looked at just the consumer conversation around it and the more we did our research to understand. And, and I will say on that point, doing the research around any of these um, supply chains or any of these ingredients can be pretty tricky because A, most of them are incredibly probably nuanced in some ways, right? There's some parts that are black and white, but there's incredible nuance in what's good for you, what the carbon footprint is, and across all supply chains, like seafood, oils, yeah. uh, poultry, vegetables. And so we spend a lot of time trying to understand and become experts on all these categories so we can make the best decisions possible and then ultimately be transparent with those decisions to our customers. Um, so we saw this growing conversation. And for us, it was really understanding what we think is important to try to shift some of the standard practices in fast food, but also what we think our customers would really value. And so we talk a lot about price value at Sweetgreen, and we spend so much time and energy and you know money sourcing our food and building our network of farmers and growers and this incredible roster of ingredients. And so oils, um, as you look at the last couple of years, um, it had become a growing conversation. And to your point, there's all these voices online on social media that have really started to focus in on the specifics around oils and what part of our diet that makes up and our caloric intake and what's good for you, what's bad for you. And, and so as we looked around, we saw that no chains or large scale restaurant groups are really thinking about this hmm. or really talking about it. And we look at our menu every year and we say, what can we upgrade? And this was the investment we wanted to make. We thought it was a really important conversation. And we decided to change all of our cooking oil to extra virgin olive oil and avocado oil, which we were switching from high oleic sunflower oil, mm. which again, this goes back to part of the nuance, has a very similar fatty acid profile to the two that we're switching to and and generally is is you know, different than a lot of the other um, when people say seed oils. Okay. Technically, it's a seed oil, but for us, it's really trying to understand the nuance and what customers would value. And we were excited to make that switch and announcement. And, you know, the response has been incredible. So I definitely want to get into how your supply chain works, because my understanding is it's different to a lot of other um, chain eateries. But just on olive oil in particular, maybe avocado oil as well, but it seems like you're doing this at kind of a, maybe a bad time because I'm looking at a chart. <laughs> oh, yeah. Of virgin chart olive oil. Yes. Yeah. And it's I, I mean, it reached a record earlier this year and it's still phenomenally high. So how do you manage the cost of mm. making the switch? And I'm curious also, do you hedge something like olive oil purchases? Great question. So it is, if you're looking at the chart around the olive oil markets, given some of the um, the situation in you know Greece and Spain and with weather and, and with the weather and droughts and fires, the olive oil markets have really are at an all time high. We see that as a more short term blip. We know that ultimately will come down to some version of steady state. We decided it was still worth the investment, um, and we're able to really think about how to offset that creatively within our supply chain. So there was no price increase connected to this for our customers, and really just wanted to create value there for our customers on the menu. And part of the reason of having olive oil and avocado oil was also to be able to hedge between the two. Hmm. Typically in our supply chain, our more important SKUs, we do think about contracts, really think about locking in great prices. Uh, and we have an incredible supply chain team that spends time um, in the field with our farmers and growers and with our partners and and really does a great job, you know, sourcing incredibly high quality ingredients and, you know, paying a price that makes sense for our business, but also makes sense for our partners. So when you decide to switch to, you know, from seed oils, something flour oil to olive oil slash avocado. How do you go about 
sourcing mm. that oil. And and again, maybe this is a good way to get into the differences between your supply chain and how you're sourcing things versus other restaurants. Because my understanding is the majority of restaurants, they will go through like large food distributors, whereas you are sourcing directly from farmers and doing a lot of that transportation yourself, I guess. A bit so. So the way our supply chain works is, you know, we spend a lot of time understanding the different inputs and having direct relationships with our uh, growers, farmers, food partners. So we go direct to the source. We still use distributors to move that product around oh, okay. just because right. there was an efficient, there's a very efficient infrastructure around that. And, you know, we're not in the distribution business and um, that's not part of the sweet green model. But we spend a lot of time directly with the farmers, growers, and food sources, people growing and raising our food to really understand how those products fit um, our ethos. And so we have a, a food ethos that really guides all the decisions and investments we make in in our menu, things like focusing on regenerative organic uh, growers and produce, um, clean oils, really thinking about um, the animal re responsibility of how animals are raised. And so for us, we have this you know, detailed food ethos that really guides our supply chain team uh, and our culinary team and allows us to really make the right decisions. We then very often will contract prices directly with growers and partners, and then we use our distribution partners to move that product around into our restaurants. And so you know, we celebrate seasonality, regionality. We work with some of the country's greatest farmers and growers that are growing the highest quality products um, across the country. And really proud of that. Every single one of our restaurants does have a board that lists every single source. And not just of like, you know, the cool ingredients like this peaches in season. I'm going to tell you where it's from. Our oils, our rice, really sharing full transparency around all of our ingredients to really, again, lift the curtain between customers and uh, their food. And so for us, we think that's really important. And ultimately, we do all that because we think it leads to the best tasting food. Mm. When things are grown right in the right soil uh, with the right methods and you're sourcing high quality food, ultimately, we, we are doing all fresh prep in our restaurants. But it is it is not like you know high end culinary <laughs> chef driven um, protocols in cooking. It is very simply taking high quality ingredients and prepping them very minimally for our uh, customers. By the way, just for those at home or those curious, Tracy, I did, first of all, I did not realize we actually had spot olive oil prices yeah. on the terminal. Yeah. I guess I shouldn't be surprised, though. <laughs> uh, the ticker OLO8SSM1. In 2020, it was 2,000 euros for a metric ton of uh, extra virgin spot oil, olive oil. It's recently 8,000. So that's a four-bagger since 2020. Uh, pretty extraordinary. Okay, one last question on the seed oils. We're not really going to go 45 <laughs> minutes. Which is how we met, by the way, yeah, on Twitter. Yeah, I know. On Twitter, <laughs> right. But actually, this is this is one last question on the seed oil, and then we can move on. How much is it about, like, okay, there's a bunch of pe weirdos with, you know, anonymous ad avatars talking about seed oils all of a sudden. So, and they're like, okay, there's clearly a conversation here. People want a higher quality oil, et cetera. But I don't know who these people are and I'm, I can't read the science versus like you independently saying, you know what? I think actually avocado oil and olive oil setting aside the Twitter chatter are better, healthier oils that you've independently sort of done research on independent of what weirdos on the internet say. Great question. It is more the latter. And okay. it's really understanding, you know, we've made so many great decisions around our supply chain and our menu and how we source just based on what we think is right, what direction we want to shift the industry in. As I look back on the 16 years, we've made a lot of decisions on our menu and supply chain that honestly, folks thought we were a bit crazy when we did it. And ultimately, you know, what's we, an example of something that people thought was crazy, you know, opening and not serving like having a soda fountain program. You don't have cheddar cheese, right? We don't have, we've had cheddar cheese at moments. We don't have yeah, it today. What's up with that? <laughs> Is that a request for cheddar cheese? No, I, I'm actually curious. Like, that seems like a weird yeah. decision to me. That, like, when you say, actually, because that struck me. I, I've gone to Sweet Grain a handful of times, just a normal cheese. Like, that seems like an interesting decision to me. Yeah, you know, I would say there are dozens of ingredients that would be incredible on our menu, and there, we just can't, we don't have room for them all. all, right, all right, um, our menu does evolve and things come on and off, and so cheddar is definitely something that might make its way back on the menu okay. one day. Wait, so speaking of <laughs> Red this... headline breaking news <laughs> when this comes out, cheddar might come back one day. So speaking of things that can come on and off the menu and also weirdos on the internet, um, <laughs> as part of my research, I was looking on Twitter, and it seems like the thing people are most upset about at Sweet Green at the moment is you stop serving beets. And I can read you like 
dozens of <laughs> tweets on this subject. No beats is killing my vibe. No longer serves beats in the shroomami. So you're just going to completely alter the ingredients. Where, TF, are the beets? Like, this goes on and on and on. But, like, what happens when that kind of ingredient is no longer available? Is it a seasonal choice? Is it a supply choice? Like, clearly there is some customer demand for beets. First of all, I love that there's this much passion around beets, uh, <laughs> which, is, which is really incredible. But, you know, our menu evolves quite a bit. And this is related to a big menu um, launch we did about two months ago with a new category on our menu called protein plates. Uh, so launching these more center of um, plate protein plates that have grains and protein and veg and, and no lettuce, so not a salad. And really thinking about just, you know, a completely different occasion for customers and new customers. And this is based on a lot of customer feedback we heard about options they wish they had at sweet green or just out there in general when whenever we add things to the menu we also do remove things okay otherwise is, we would is that you know, just to like streamline and keep the location you know, it's, it's efficient, this or? idea of skew rationalization and just efficiency for an operation for your prep for just the number of ingredients you have in your restaurant and if we just kept adding a couple things every year you'd wake up 10 years later having way too many ingredients way mm. too complex an operation and, and it would take customers yeah. seven minutes to order now I, instead of six <laughs> i'm surprised though about the beats because one of the stories I remember from years ago is that Sweet Green teamed up with the rapper Kendrick Lamar for a salad called Beats yes. Don't Kill My Vibe. <laughs> that was that was the reference in that tweet. Yeah, yes. yeah. And the, the Verge headline, I ate a salad named after a Kendrick Lamar song. Anyway, <laughs> but, that, but, but so actually this raises an interesting question. I mean, I like Sweet Green. I go there sometimes. Uh, I go to Chipotle sometimes. Chipotle doesn't seem to change its. Mm. I mean, every once in a while, it it adds a, a different. They'll have kind like a new meat, meat, but it's or like really similar for the decade I don't know, or however long. Why is it important to switch it up? You know, today we have 220 restaurants in 20 states, and we're, we're continuing to grow into different parts of the country and, and really broaden who our customer is and who we can serve, and, and which is really exciting. And so, for us, aside from just the seasonality in our ethos and really wanting to celebrate incredible produce and ingredients uh, as they come in and out of season at peak freshness, it's important for us to just keep evolving and broadening. You know, the addition of protein plates for us was about creating a new occasion and attracting a new consumer that maybe doesn't want to eat a salad or are existing customers that maybe don't want a salad every day. And, you know, especially one of the things we've been hearing from our consumers, I mean, you know, we're reading and seeing all the same things that you all are in the world around value and just the consumer wallet and, and what they're feeling right now. And customers certainly want value more than ever now. And so as we think about places in the world today to get quick, clean, delicious, healthy dinner options uh, and the convenience and a price that makes sense, you know, it, it's it's not easy. And so for us to launch something like protein plates, it's what our customers are telling us they would love for dinner. And so to have, you know, between 15 and 16 bucks, a plate of, you know, clean, pseudo free uh, cooked proteins and grains that is hearty and delicious really appealed to our consumers and is striking a chord for where they are right now. So you mentioned um, the number of stores that you have, and I, I think you are rolling out um, quite a bit outside of the traditional urban centers. So Midtown Manhattan, um, L.A., those sorts of places. Do you find as you open stores outside of cities that tastes are different hmm. there versus, say, a Midtown Manhattan? Is that part of the reason why you've you know unveiled the new menu? Yes, overall. Um, you know, I would say it's been exciting for us to really broaden where Sweet Green is and who we can serve. And so as we do that, broadening the menu is, is a really exciting objective. And, and that doesn't just mean adding new categories like protein plates. You know, over the past year, we've also added some really incredible flavors and ingredients on our menu. Things like, you know, a really clean barbecue sauce in a barbecue chicken plate and salad that uh, mm. we made with a chef in um, Chicago named Charlie McKenna, who's the world champion of barbecue sauce. Oh, that's and cool. we made a, a version of his sauce with no refined sugars and according to our ethos, and it is delicious. And so thinking about broader flavors and ingredients, more protein at the center of the plate, the protein plates we did launch have up to 50 grams of protein per plate, which the focus on protein right now for consumers consumers is really, really big. And so we heard that from our-, our Protein's our, hot right now. <laughs> yes, protein is very hot right now. Uh, and ultimately, like anything at Sweet Green, you can come and customize and create what you want. So if you want double protein or no protein, you can really create the meal you want. Talk to us about the intersection of plate design 
with the food inflation that we've seen over mm. the last few years. I have to imagine that, you know, 2014, 2013, early in Sweet Green's era, it probably just wasn't much of a constraint. And I imagine that it's a lot trickier now or maybe more of like an engineering or puzzle problem to solve like, okay, food has gotten a lot more expensive. And so given these constraints and given the desire to like have a economical price point, you have to like solve for X. Talk about plate design in the era of higher commodity costs. You know, for us, as we have scaled and now that we're at a certain size versus, you know, 10 years ago, yeah. it's not just about price and design. And I can talk about that, but it's also about just creating more resilience in our supply chain. So when okay. we do launch something like olive oil or sourcing ingredient, you know, we have to think about it at a much different scale and thinking about having yeah. secondary and tertiary sources. And and so, you know, when you have 50 restaurants versus a couple of hundred, just having the resiliency in the supply chain is more critical than ever. But, you know, for us, engineering and designing a menu and a plate and these entrees is really starts with a ton of time spent with our customer, understanding and not just existing customers, but prospective customers, people that don't come to Sweetgreen or people that have heard about it and have never come or people that have never heard about it. So really understanding what would drive intent to purchase for them and what appeals to them. And then, you know, then we take, that's kind of the science side. Then we take the art side and understand, you know, what we think is exciting in, in food, in, in our supply chain, what flavors we want to really talk about and celebrate. And we marry those two things and we do a lot of customer testing. So we put a lot of products in front of customers to really understand how it makes them feel and how how the flavors work. And, and then ultimately for us, when you talk about inflation and price, we focus a lot on price value. So, you know, we spend all this time sourcing really high quality ingredients, creating this experience in the restaurants where our team members are taking those ingredients, prepping them from scratch and creating this fresh, incredible product that then you have all these channels to interact with. So the convenience of whether it's our app or the pickup shelves. And so it's not just about the price of your menu, it's also the price value. And so making sure that whatever the customer is paying, they feel like it's worth it and the value is there. And so that's why so much of it for us is really communicating all the work that goes into the quality of our ingredients and getting credit for that. And the olive oil change was one of those examples where we really want to tell this story. And, you know, for us, we were the first national chain to really use clean oils and talk about it. And so, you know, we're excited to see if that continues to spread in the industry, if other folks will do that. And there are some other great, you know, concepts out there talking about this, but at scale, we haven't really seen that. So it's exciting to see and talk about those things. So ultimately customers can come to Sweet Green and say, okay, this feels worth it. The value is here for what I'm paying. Nick, you keep mentioning scale, which, you know, fair enough, you're, you're still a young company and you're still clearly growing. But I guess I'm curious, like, how important is scale to the overall strategy to achieve profitability? And I think you were profitable in a recent quarter on an adjusted EBITDA basis. Mm -hmm. So, like, there there is some progress there. But do, do you need to get to a certain size in order to have pricing power in the market for things like ingredients or hmm. maybe even labor in order to start making profits on a sort of regular basis? You know, scale is definitely important. And, you know, as we have made so many incredible investments over the last few years in our technology, our supply chain, continuing to leverage our, our, our g and our home office to really, you know, create that path to profitability. We've, we have had two quarters of adjusted EBITDA profitability, so we are excited about the progress and well on our way. And, you know, but when you talk about scale, you know, 220 something restaurants sounds big and it certainly would have sounded big to me a few years ago, but it is still very small relative to the opportunity we have in fast food and in our category. And you look at so many of these larger competitors and there are thousands, if not tens of thousands of restaurants. And so 16 years in 220 restaurants, we still think we are very early in our journey. And so we're excited to build sustained and profitable growth. And it really, you know, in this time more than ever, being really disciplined about the growth. You know, we opened in five new states in the past 12 to 18 months and bringing Sweet Green to communities and states where we probably rewind 10 years ago, maybe didn't think we'd get to. What's in it? Where? Where's that? You know, we, we've had really exciting growth in the Midwest. Hmm. So opening in Indiana, in Michigan, in, you know, all over the Chicago area. And it's been really exciting to see. And Minneapolis, really excited to see our growth there and how the brand was received. And we've got some really exciting growth there also. How seasonal are sales in places like the Midwest? I'm just curious, when it's really cold, <laughs> I personally do not crave a salad, although I admire your objectives to make craveable options for presumably year round. But do you see like a big dip in places like Minneapolis in the winter? 
Unlike, say, L.A., where I imagine yeah. that's all people want to eat 365 days a year. You know, we've had one full winter in, in, in the broader Midwest, but uh, we do see seasonality, right? And I think um, a lot of restaurants do, but I think with our product, especially the salad category, we do see more seasonality that affects it. We have, you know, actually the larger category on our menu is more the warm bowl, so things that have hardier grains and more mm. proteins in them. And then, honestly... That was part of the intention of the protein plates was also mm. to think about if you are a sweet green eater and you've eaten, you know, a lot of salad, you know, once a week or twice a week uh, in the summer and fall when winter hits. And it's just one of those days where you want something a little heartier or you want something for dinner. And it just isn't a salad. Even, you know, the, the greatest of salad eaters don't want to eat that every single day. And so really starting to create that range and breadth on our menu for existing and new consumers that just hits a different need state. It's satiating in a different way. And so it's been really exciting to see even early on just the effect on dinner and then now as we enter the winter to really see how protein plates will perform. We just launched it six weeks ago, but the signs have been really exciting so far. Talk about the Midwest a little bit more specifically. You recently opened up a robotic concept in Naperville, Illinois, in which robots make the sale it. And I have to imagine that there's a lot of interest in a lot of people these days for service automation, given tightness of the labor markets, etc. What is the hardest part about automating the process of making a salad? So we did open our first automated sweet green in Naperville, Illinois, uh, about six months ago. We acquired an incredibly talented group of individuals um, with a company called Spice two years ago and have since started building the sweet green version of that machine called the Infinite Kitchen. And so we launched it six months ago. And really so much about designing this format and that restaurant was you know, the technology was really important in the actual automation and the robotics, but it was more about the full experience that wraps it. And thinking about today, the experience our customers are going from where they walk into a restaurant, you know, they're pointing at their ingredients on a line, interacting with a team member, but also thinking about the friction that exists in this existing format of, I'm sure you've been into a sweet green at peak lunch and it can be intense, right? Yeah. There's a line out the door, people are trying to move fast, people want to order, things are flying, <laughs> things are going fast. And, you know, our team members who do an incredible job, you know, have to be fast, friendly, and accurate at the same time, which is really hard. And so for us, you know, understanding what we love about our current format and experience and, and what friction we want to um, create, so much of the work was more around the experience we wanted to build around the automation and thinking about the different roles and how the team members play a role that is actually more around hospitality and less around assembly. So the Infinite Kitchen assembles the meal, yeah. but our team members now get to really spend their time interacting with customers, more focused on hospitality, maybe talking to them about our supply chain. I just want to drive home this question, though, of like the salad construction mm -hmm. challenge, because especially I have to imagine, you know, the hospitality component for say like restaurants that are making doing a lot of money on delivery, uh, so it's not as important. What is the challenge? I, w I was in San Francisco one time and I went to a robotic coffee shop. Yeah. It was truly a terrible experience. Like <laughs> I don't, they just I can't imagine how they screwed it up so badly, and I don't think it's there anymore. But what is the actual constraint? Because I, I watched the video of how the Naperville thing works. Looks pretty straightforward, etc. So from a sort of like workflow operation standpoint. A lot of economists, businesses must be really interested in how much service sector work can be automated. What makes it hard? Well, I, you know, to your point, I do believe that fast forward in the next decade yeah. or beyond, automation will play a role in food, right? And in, in restaurants, I think it will have to. And I think it shifts the team member experience. It shifts the experience for the customer. And what makes it hard is just the technology. There's no the off the shelf solutions don't mm. exist today. And every restaurant has different menus with different ingredients that need to be handled differently. I think you're starting to see, you know, there, there are many automated solutions in coffee. There's some in pizza. You know, you're starting to see some more spot automation where they can do one task, you know, or one discrete task. Um, the Infinite Kitchen for us that was built um, at Sweetgreen, it you know, assembles the majority of the meal. And then there's a finishing station where our team member gets to finish the bowl or plate mm. with you know the fresh herbs or the piece of protein or a sauce. And then it's handed to the customer by the team member. So the idea was that the, the transaction, even though your bowl is mostly assembled by this automated machine, starts and ends with human hands. And there is this opportunity for more hospitality in a calmer environment. And there's all these other benefits that really start to create a ton of value for the customer on 
perfect accuracy in the machine, perfect right. portioning, perfect temperature control, speed. You know. So this is coming. This is coming. We're actually opening our second one in a few days in California. Hmm. What about simpler automation? And I think when we hear salad making robots, you know, everyone has a vision of like <laughs> a robot chopping up lettuce or something like that. But you could have automation on things like salad dressing. So you can pre-mix the salad dressings and maybe that saves costs. So something a little bit less high tech, I guess. Yeah, I think there will be a number of solutions from small discrete tasks that are automated to larger, you know, full, full concepts automated over the next couple of years. And, you know, like I said, you're seeing that today, which is exciting. Over the past decade, there was a ton of funding that went into so many of these startups. And I think the environment's a little tougher today, obviously, in that world. Um, that's why we were really excited to partner with and acquire the Spice team because they're brilliant and the technology they had built was really wonderful. And so marrying that with our brand and our food has really been an incredible combination. But, you know, today the Infinite Kitchen does do assembly, dressing, dispensing and mixing. So it has it does the majority of the process. Uh, and then a few things are finished at the end by hand. But it's been really incredible to watch that experience and how consumers are interacting with it. I want to talk a little bit more about the labor market. And I think I read in your last earnings call, much like much of the economy, things are getting a little bit easier. It looks like on the hiring side, on the wage side, et cetera. But what I'm curious about in particular is during the sort of peak of the labor market tightness, maybe 21, early 2022, when so many companies were expressing frustration about hiring, how do you sort of keep up a minimum quality expectation. You talked about that hospitality and people have a certain expectation of what it's going to be like when they go into a sweet green. And at, in a time of high churn, difficulty hiring, et cetera, talk to us about the process of maintaining that when I imagine an employee who's been there three years is much better than the person who's been on the job three days. How do you maintain that quality at a time of a lot of, I guess, very green, fresh employees? Great question. You know, I think the last couple of years was really challenging in so many ways. I think, you know, obviously at the peak of COVID, so much of the operation and the experience for a team member, not only the customer, but for the team member was totally flipped around, right? Wearing masks while you're working, mm. having these plexi screens, having all this different like safety protocol, which was all there for a reason. And like, you know, we had to move fast on so much of that stuff, but it did alter and shift the team member experience pretty radically. And I forget the exact number, but our, our industry did lose millions of workers during that time. Mm -hmm. And so it was really challenging. What's really been exciting about this year is as, as we have seen labor markets ease is, you know, our, we have seen our turnover come down, which has been really exciting. And to your point, having team members that are here and passionate about the mission and, you know, being developed and growing in the organization is just a wonderful thing for both sides. And, but whenever the labor markets are hard or even now, the focus for us is really on just like we listen to our customers, spending as much time listening to our team members and understanding how we can better the team member experience. And that's everything from uniforms to wage to training uh, modules to physical experience in the restaurants. And so we spend a lot of time really understanding how we can consistently improve the team member experience and just continue to invest in them. So the other thing that seems to get people worked up on the internet, aside from <laughs> seed oils and, and beets, beets is tipping. Oh, yeah. I tipping think, on an iPad. Yes, on a screen. And I think this is something you recently started yes. incorporating into the business model. So I have so many questions on this issue, and we've been meaning to do an episode exclusively on tipping for a while, but we haven't quite gotten around to it. But first of all, why did you decide to do that? Second of all, what's been the customer response? And I guess like third of all, the question that everyone asks on this issue is always, why are the customers subsidizing the labor costs of a company? Great question. And when I talk about spending a lot of time understanding and talking to the team members and just understanding the landscape out there, tipping was the number one thing we really heard from our team members that they value and that, you know, quite often have at other places. And so, you know, the back end of how you actually bring that to life can be pretty complex. It's different state by state, different channel by channel with whether, you know, whether it's on the app or in person or so integrating all the different technology behind the scenes to bring that to life is pretty complex. So, I mean, shout out to our tech team and our CTO, but it was a pretty big project. And we did. Sorry, sorry, what was the change? Tipping, adding tipping. No, but, so, okay, so they so, didn't have yeah. it before, it, like it. where you could optionally it. Okay, tip. Okay, sorry. So adding tipping for our team members. Got it. And right, keep going. Yeah, Joe, so, does this mean you're not tipping your sweet green <laughs> salad actually, makers you haven't noticed? <laughs> To be, can I say, don't listen, Nick. So I haven't been going to the sweet green lately. It's just, 
Anyway, keep going. That's the only reason I hadn't noticed. We'll have to it, get you back to try the plates. So I will. I'll come back, back for the plates. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Keep going. And so you know, this is something we constantly heard from our team members when we when they we wanted do tips, roundtables, yeah. and when we just you know spend time with them, understanding how we can improve the team member value prop and experience. And so we spent a year building this. And, and like I said, the the back end of how this comes to life is pretty complex. Uh, I had no idea it was that complicated because I always assumed like it was a something provided by like the the payment vendor. And you could just like plug and play. You know, it depends what your existing tech infrastructure is of who your payment provider is, who the POS is, you know, what your app, what your app is built on. You know, state. We're in twenty states, so the state by state regulation makes it also more complex. But you know, it's it's a pretty hairy thing to build. But our team built it. They did it brilliantly. We spent a lot of time talking to team members and customers to understand even the details of the experience of what are the prompts, what make you know how these would make you feel, and did a test. And it's been really incredible to see um, the results so far. I mean, our team. Members Members are really pleased. It's adding, you know, a great amount to their to their wage. And the most exciting thing is, we do believe there is inherently a like a service flywheel here, right? So hmm. team members know that you know the hospitality is incentivized, and so it makes them care about that customer experience even more. But I guess the thing I don't get about optional tipping for something like a bowl or a, a salad chain is like, first of all, you know, you talked about the importance of hospitality training anyway. So presumably like everyone should be really friendly. But then I'm also tipping for stuff before I've even eaten it. And it's hard for me to judge like the quality of the salad bowl construction before I've actually tasted it. So I, I guess probably like a lot of people, I feel guilty enough that I will do the optional tipping. But like I also feel a little bit annoyed about it because I'm not sure what I'm tipping for. You know, it's a great point. I think for us, the experience was built in a way where, you know, consumers can self-select into tipping or no tipping. And we didn't want to add that pressure. And so, you know, one of the prompts is no tip. And it's, you know, I think you go to some places today and it's like 30, 35, yeah. 25. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the minimum is now like 40%. Yes. Or I saw one where it was like... 25 20 30 and so yeah. they like switched up the order or something like that oh, so the button where you intuitively sneaky. would do the anyway yeah and going. so for us there's a lot of intentionality and in all the details there and funny enough we we're also getting a lot of requests from customers that wanted to tip that right we're going into their sweet green every day that had their favorite team member that had you know they were they were just regulars and they said I want a tip. I want to like. I want to connect with my team members and reward them for the incredible service, and they they make my day. And so for us, this was just something we you know we were really excited to launch both for team members and customers. And we think the experience we built around it is really thoughtful and intentional to let customers self select into whatever journey they want there. You know, as Tracy mentioned, this is one of those things that on the internet people are really annoyed by. I'm not surprised uh, that the employees would like it because it seems like almost total, uh, uh, you know, pretty straightforward, goes right to the wage line. Have you seen any pushback? Did the whining online translate into any less activity? You know, it's still, pretty er it's still pretty early for okay. us, so we are still learning and watching. So far, it's been really positive. Like anything we roll out, whether it's menu or features like tipping, we're, you know, we're learning and, and evolving as we need to, but so far it's been really positive. I recently learned there's an actual terminology for um, the idea of companies becoming more sophisticated with their pricing options. It's called price pack architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I never heard that. Yeah, I hadn't heard it either. But I do feel like this is becoming more of a thing for companies where like the goal is to offer a suite of price options so you have a cheaper thing for people who want that but you also have the premium products you also now have the option to add 20 percent on to you know the cost um in, in return for service is that something that you're you're mindful of as a growth company it is. And as we really expand to all these different places around the country and, and really get excited about welcoming new customers into Sweetgreen and into the funnel, the pricing strategy is really built on just having that range of prices. So entry points for different people. You know, we have a bowl on our menu that is starts under 10 bucks in every market. So if you want to self-select into that, you can. If you want to do triple protein and add everything into your bowl or plate, you can get, you know, a very expensive plate that fits your needs and, and fits what you're looking for. But at the end of the day, it also does come back to the idea of price value that I talked about. So so often customers, you know, what we hear and what we know is that regardless of the price they're paying, it's more about was it worth that price? And so, but the range, making sure that, you know, consumers can self-select into whatever price they want. And, you know, it also connects to their frequency. We have customers that are coming to Sweetgreen quite often. We have a loyalty program that has a subscription piece as well for those highly frequent guests that creates some value there as well. Tracy, now that you're uh, getting into deadlifting, 
You got to get the uh, the protein plate with the triple protein. I'm not getting into deadlifting <laughs> at all. Right now, my capacity to deadlift is absolutely zero. So for people who don't know, I um I, I have like a tendonitis type thing that is um flaring up again and I can barely like lift my phone let alone weights. But I appreciate all the guys online who are telling me to use straps yeah. when like <laughs> just to be clear, I am not going to be deadlifting at all in the foreseeable future. Okay. Well, I guess you don't need the triple protein. Let's talk about I introed this conversation by saying what's great about a bowl of anything is I can eat it at my desk in my office while and sort of just stare at the screen and consume calories. What have you seen in terms of work from home offices? I'm sure you did not anticipate the degree of working from home and the changing of urban centers and delivery, all these different things when you started it. And obviously the work environment in 2023 is very different than 2019. What has that meant for Sweet Green and the business model? You know, over the last couple of years, we have seen our consumer shift around a lot, just like everyone in the industry. Yeah. What was fortunate for us was even pre-COVID, we had started shifting a lot of our pipeline and our growth into suburban centers. And for the past few years, the majority of our growth and openings have been in more suburban residential areas. So our footprint has become more balanced. And over the last couple of years, there's been certain assumptions that you know everyone has made around return to work and what yeah. it's going to look like. And I think the world is kind of, we've all been wrong. So I think we've just yeah. accepted that where it is today is maybe where it stays. And we're building our business around that. And what's really exciting is seeing, I think, as we broaden our menu and we have all these channels, things like delivery and pickup, just seeing people fall into their new rhythms and behaviors wherever they are working or living. And so it's been really exciting to see the strength of our you know, suburban restaurants and seeing people really um, incorporate that into their routine versus before it might have just been the place they get lunch in their office. So we started this conversation talking about hatred for seed oils. And you mentioned that proteins are becoming a thing as they're well. They're hot. Yeah, they're very hot right now. What's the next thing on the yeah. horizon, like the next food related matter that we can all obsess over? You know, for us, I do think oils and the fat quality, I think it will be a huge conversation that will grow. And that's why we decided to make the investment. I think if you look at even the data of the caloric consumption and how much of the average person's daily calorie intake is coming from these highly processed oils, it has increased so much in the past couple of decades and it's in everything. So I think that visibility and transparency for consumers is going to be a huge topic of conversation. And, and uh, obviously when you connect that to like just the metabolic state of things in this country and chronic disease, I well, think there, there's oh, a much bigger conversation. Than oh, yeah, I think Joe Tracy and I just and I had, had the same, the same thought. thought when you said metabolic, but uh, how are you thinking about anticipating a world in which more and more of your customers may be on Ozempic or a GLP-1. And I have to imagine, unlike some other, you know, you're uh, probably a higher end consumer, typically people who can perhaps uh, afford it more easily at the current price points. Have you seen anything now? Or more importantly, perhaps, are you thinking of anything strategically in terms of a world in which many more people are on these drugs? You know, just like anything that grows really quickly, we're watching it and learning and trying to understand. I think what's really exciting for the type of food we serve is whether you're on something like Ozempic or you're, you know, just trying to create a different lifestyle or you just you want food that makes you feel good. Sweet Green kind of fits all those use cases. I think folks that are on a product like Ozempic are mm -hmm. probably cutting out more of the higher caloric, less, you know, yeah. clean food options. And so we're watching it, we're learning, we're, you know, we're trying to understand how our consumer is shifting. But ultimately, I think what's really exciting is as our menu gets broader, I think it creates more reasons for customers to come to Sweet Green, not just for health or for, you know, caloric or metabolic reasons, but that ends up being like a plus on the back and they're eating something that is craveable and that, you know, is satiating, but that also is good for you. I feel like we have to get Sweet Green for lunch now. Uh, it's like mandatory. Definitely. Yes. I, I'm true. sorry I haven't been to one in a few years. I'll start going well, back. So where are you going to lunch? <laughs> um, there's a knockoff kava a couple blocks away. What's the knockoff kava? I forget what it's called. It's just, it's like the same thing, just a little worse. Yeah. And uh, I go to the dig, the dig, mm. of, it is so, the, mainly because it's like literally So you love 60. seed oils, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I wanna, I'll, I'll check out, I'll go to this. I say that as a broader comment of the rest of the industry. A little subtweet of the industry. No, that was a lot of fun. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, of course.
Tracy, that was fun. We should go. We definitely we should go to a sweet green soon. Test it out. I, I I'm gonna get one of those triple protein bowls. I'm gonna, I know. I'm, I was I'm just gonna thinking, max it out. I have a real craving a 25, for protein now. Yeah, with a, I have a major protein craving right now, and I'm gonna put the uh, the max tip option. Yeah. Now that was a really interesting conversation, and we kind of hit a lot of the big yeah. talking points um, in consumer goods well is it a good in food right Consumer now Consumer services yeah like the idea of labor costs yes. the addition of tipping um and how maybe that helps a little bit on the labor market tightness although as nick said like the worst of that seems to be over the sophistication in yeah. pricing i feel like that's a real trend and it is true I don't know how many of the apps you've signed up for but it is true that you can get a lot lower prices through like the loyalty programs for a lot of chains right now. I'm just so lazy. You can put in your email. You address, should do it. It's it's download an app. It's oh. worth it, Joe. All right, maybe maybe I will. No, but that was a that was a really fun conversation. You know, it is pretty striking to switch to olive oils given that chart. Yeah, I mean, that's a wild chart. Yeah, it will be interesting to see whether or not it normalizes and how quickly. Also, I want to do more, Tracy, on the roboticization of uh, services, especially at a, if delivery, Uber Eats, Seamless, all of these different Grubhub, whatever it's called. You know, you don't care about the hospitality experience in those conditions. Intuitively, you would think that there's a lot of opportunity and demand from the business side to find ways to automate the creation of people's lunches. But it really just like has not taken off so far at all. And I, like I said, I went into a coffee shop. Coffee, I would think, should be really like the easy one. And it was a terrible experience. So I wanted to have a better understanding of like, what really is the constraint? Is it scale? Is it the fact that there's nothing off the shelf? What is it? Just to be clear, it hasn't taken off in the U.S. Mm. Um, I mean, I remember like 20 years ago in Tokyo, you had robotic servers. Like you would actually yeah. order through, it wasn't an app back then, but it was like a little machine at the table and then someone would bring it out to you. And that was right. like a fairly normal thing at Izakaya's, but it's taken a lot longer But the here. assembly side still. Yeah, the assembly and, and side seems difficult. But again, like there's gradations of assembly. Yeah. So you can have like a giant mixer that's mixing salad dressing. And that seems fairly easy to do versus like an actual, you know, um, Jetson style robot that's like washing and cutting up the lettuce. We got to do more robotics. I feel like service, pro like this is a sort of fact about the economy, which is that manufactured goods tend to see productivity gains over time and services tend to have stagnant productivity, at least as far is the best we can measure them but if we had like this sort of chat gpt of robots an actual good mm. ro an actual good robot which i don't think many exist so far but if we had one maybe we would actually see some uh, productivity well, gain. it is true there does seem to have been this like huge gap between the amount of money going into robotics versus the amount of money going into ai yeah right? so we have all this artificial intelligence but we don't actually have the like physical mm. machinery to put some of it to use johnny five yeah. <laughs> Not really neat. All right. Shall we leave it there? Let's leave it there. This has been another episode of the All Thoughts Podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. You can follow me at Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisenthal. You can follow me at The Stalwart. Follow uh, Nicholas Jemay. He's at Nicholas Jemay, where he is monitoring your tweets about uh, <laughs> seed oils. Follow our producers, Carmen Rodriguez at Carmen Armin, Dash Bennett at Dashbot, and Kale Brooks at Kale Brooks. And thank you to our producer, Moses Andam. For more Odd Lots content, go to Bloomberg.com slash Odd Lots, where we have a blog, transcript, and the newsletter and check out our discord discord.gg slash oddlots and if you enjoy oddlots if you want us to do more episodes on either seed oils or robots then please leave us a positive review on your favorite podcast platform thanks for listening 